Dr. Cohen with part two of Learn How to Pick Stocks, Help by a Quantum Annealing Computer. This is Jeffrey Cohen, founder, CEO of Chicago Quantum and U.S. Advanced Computing Infrastructures Incorporated. So the first video, what you heard was you heard the, uh, the motivation for the paper. You heard our initial formulations classically. You learned how to find the paper and we walk through the classical approaches. So in this section, we're going to walk through the quantum portions, which I'm sure you've all been waiting for. So move this out of the way. So now you know. We are Chicago Quantum. Here is the paper. So you find it in the archive. You can just search on portfolio optimization of 40 stocks. Let's get back to the paper. So, using an annealing quantum computer, the first thing we have to figure out is what is an optimal portfolio? You see again, the sharp ratio, which is a 70-year-old method, just doesn't work on a quantum computer. So, it has to fit into a cubo. So, a cubo is a quadratic, unconstrained, binary optimization problem. So it has to be binary. It likes ones and zeros, right? And it has to be linear. So a cubo is another word for a matrix. We're doing some matrix math here. And so we're going to now make the walk from the Sharpe ratio to the Chicago quantum net score. And I'm going to try not to lose you. So the Sharpe ratio takes beta, which is based on the stock's movement the overall stock market times your expectation of the stock market minus your expectation of the risk-free rate of return and then all that you then add back the risk-free rate of return so you're multiplying beta times the part of the return that comes just from the stock market and then you're adding back in risk-free now you need to know a lot of things to do the top part you need to know what's a risk-free return we're using one year 13 week returns on US Treasuries. You have a choice. You can do one year Treasuries. Uh, the guys didn't like that though. Also, what's your return to the stock market? You could look at the last year. You could look at a mix of indices. There's a lot of thinking involved. We used S&P 500, big stocks. Wilshire 5000, lots of stocks. And the Russell 2000, which is much smaller stocks. And we took the average of those with a floor set up. We then also divide it by the standard deviation of that portfolio. So your sharp ratio is what am I going to earn on the top and what's my risk on the bottom? And it can be a simple dot product, which is returns times the weight, There's the numerator, and the denominator is the square root because the standard deviation is the square root of the variance, and this is the variance. So it's the Basically, it's the sum of the variance terms, which matters, because those are your linear terms in the cubo before you apply transformations. It's where you know i equals i and j equals j, which makes sense. And then your covariance terms, it's two times your covariance terms. So that's where you have your covariance of i and j when i does not equal to j, times whether the actual asset shows up. So I've got my variance some number for let's say variance of IBM stock or international paper and then I've got two times the sum of the covariance terms between all the stocks that are in the portfolio and I do a square root. So Q sub I in my in or out is a binary classification it's one or zero. This is a real problem though because you need weights you need to know how much of the stock I'm not putting 100% of my money in each stock because I have 800%. I'm putting some portion, 10%, 5% in each stock. So we had to figure that one out. So we found that the Chicago Quantum Net Score solved the problem of all this division. So let's go ahead. When you start off with a universe of N assets, when you only have one asset portfolio, hey, I'm just going to hold Goldman Sachs, then 
you just worry about the linear term in your matrix. That's the diagonal. So, and that's easy. We actually could put the inverse of the sharp ratio right in there. And what we do is we put a penalty on the couplers. So what happens is your qubit has the value of the return. In, in this case, we're able to just put it right on. So your qubit has a certain value and your couplers have the variance and the covariance. And each one of those values is placed on a qubit. So it sure is helpful that D-Wave has 2,041 of these qubits that we can work with. Um, so when we move to two, so again, most important thing to remember is for one asset, D-Wave gets us the exact inverse of the sharp ratio, and then we just flip it. You move to two or more assets, it's very challenging, right? Now we have covariance terms. So what do we do? We had to do something artful. We create a unique cubo or a unique matrix for each size portfolio we evaluate. So if it's 40 stocks, you need a matrix that just has two stocks in the portfolio and a matrix that has three stocks in the portfolio and one that has 39 and one that has 40. So you end up with 40 of these matrices and each one is 40 by 40. And so they are um, symmetrical. Once we do that, now we have to divide the linear terms, which is, you know, expected return or just the, the weighting of that asset by a weight W sub I. Now the sum of the weights is one. We don't allow shorting and we don't allow um, buying and borrowing. So it's 100 percent. So if I have 20 stocks, 5 percent each. If I have 10 stocks, it's 10 percent each. They all equal. And then we divide the variance terms by n squared times n minus 1. Uh, that, that number, these are your diagonal entries. This, this, may, um, this may be familiar, right? This is the number of times that those uh, quadratic terms are pulled into the matrix math. And so we're dividing the variance terms by n squared times n minus 1. And we're dividing the covariance terms by n squared. This allows us to avoid duplication, but have a precise covariance in the cubo for, let's say, 10 assets or 12 assets or 15 assets. Then we apply what we call an affine transformation. So personally, I call it shift and balance. What happens is you have to shift the values around on the cubo because D-Wave is an energy-based system and it'll run. And it's possible that if you tell it to go find 20 asset solutions, that the five asset solutions look better. And they might, they might actually be better. But what happens is D-Wave will never find the 20 that you're looking for. Remember, each matrix is specific to a number of assets. So that matrix, you have to find that value, that number of assets, that portfolio size. So we apply different um, affine transformations. We do lifting and shifting, and it works. We can actually get D-Wave to find the right values when we want them. Now, it's not 100%. If we're doing a, uh, a sample of 500, we might get 50 that match. In some cases, you might get five, and you might be lucky to have those five. Um, but in other cases, you might get 150 out of 500. So you get a lot of valid portfolios to then you know, put in your box and analyze later. Finally, we apply a scaling factor between negative one and one to the cubo, and we write it into our three-dimensional matrix, n times n times n. If n is 40 assets, it will be a 40 by 40 by 40 matrix for processing by D-Wave. And then we have D-Wave loop through those. If it's 60 assets, it's a 60 by 60 by 60 matrix. It's not that complicated. This, by the way, was the second major innovation. The affine transformation, getting D-Wave to be able to find the right answers that we wanted was very important. So how do you put the problem on D-Wave? So you embed onto qubits. And the variance covariance terms are couplers. 
Those are between the qubits. And those values are stored on qubits. You scale. We talked about the negative one and one and under some hardware considerations. So just to talk about one or two. You can read the rest in the paper. As you increase your asset size, and we want to fully connect all of the stocks to each other, then each stock requires multiple qubits in chains to leverage and build the connections. If each qubit in D-Wave had connections to every other qubit, you would just need one. So you'd have 40 stocks, you'd have 40 qubits to hold them. But in this case, sometimes maybe you have to have 80 or 120 or 160 or 200. There's a thing you can do, which is chain strength. Chain strength allows you to harden those links and minimize the, the length of those chains, maybe increasing the duplication. So it allows you to get consistent results. Now, the higher the chain strength, the less breakage, but also slightly less sensitivity to finding good answers. So we work it up and down. And so we have to do that. The affine transformation. This was one I think I'm the most proud of. So what happens, and I can uh, I'll walk you through the math a bit, but let me just explain the intuition. So we're sending D-Wave a different matrix for each desired size of portfolio. So I want 10 assets in a portfolio out of 40. I need to send it a matrix for 10 because the weights are specific to 10, 1 tenth. 12 assets, 13, 15, 20, 30, 39, 40. Each one needs its own matrix. And what we do is we add a penalty, an energy penalty, for exploring portfolios that's a different size. While we maintain perfect, and I mean it, precisely perfect, accurate values for the desired portfolio size. So we can talk about how we are, you know, converting a cubo into an icing model, which is negative one to one, and there's a transformation that we do. But I, I just really want to talk about not so much the math behind it, but what we do. So, and we actually have the system give us average Chicago quantum net scores using Monte Carlo analysis we're able to fill in most of the buckets and get an average Chicago quantum net score. And then we're able to walk through and figure out roughly what's the formula that we need so that we get the right shift in each of those asset sizes. And so the shift is minus two times the best score we've seen, which is the genetic algorithm, times n, which is a, um, a number, a shift number, times m, which is a multiplier. And so our multiplier is generally around 5, but it can be anywhere really from 1.5 to 20. And so, I'm sorry, n in this case was the number of assets. So if it's 40 assets, n is 40. So it's minus 2 times g, which is the best answer we've seen, times the 40, times the shift factor, divided by the universe of stocks. And so that's important because that allows us to get valid answers. I'll give you just one other example. So the genetic algorithm said that with the sample we used, which was June 24th at 3.36 p.m. Chicago time, that the best answer was three assets out of 40. There were three all-stars that you should pick. You should hold those. You'll be great. But there's only maybe 10,000 of those three asset portfolios out of 1.1 trillion in the universe of 40 stocks. So 2 to the 40th is 1.1 trillion. So how am I going to get D-Wave to find 10,000 out of 1.1 trillion? So the shifting was extremely important, the affine transformation, so that we could get one or three valid answers which ended up being the best answers in the D-Wave as well. Now, the next thing we do is we learn how to visualize the energy landscape in D-Wave. So what happens is, so this is different than the data set we used in our 
final runs, but it's good, it's good data to illustrate the point. So this is a Chicago quantum net score to the left. This is the um, sequential order of the portfolios. So it doesn't mean maybe as much, except it runs by portfolio size. And so in the middle, you notice how the blue, the blue is the matrix. So it's the cubo that we would send a D wave. The yellow is the pure matrix that the D wave would find on the data without a shift, without an affine transformation. We're able to apply our penalty so that the values that are small bend up. The values that are large, large portfolio answers, bend up. And so the portfolios right where we want them have the lowest energy value. So D wave is going to look right there at that low energy value. So if this was a portfolio, let's say, of 10 stocks, you might get answers that look like 8 to 10 to 12. But that's not bad. You get a lot of 10 asset answers. And so, and it's not going to look at the largest and the smallest answers. Now, any answer you get that's not exactly what you're looking for, you throw away. And you accumulate what's left. So now let's talk about the results. So because I'm thinking in another video, we're actually going to share some code and show you how to do this. I'm going to walk through the workflow. It's relevant for you. You download a year of daily market data, adjusted close. By the way, it's current as of that moment. So it has that current minutes data, and you hold that data for all the experiments. You don't want to keep pulling down new data or else you can't compare the runs against each other. You then calculate the covariance of each asset against the market and develop your betas. And that's all based on log returns. So you could do raw returns, log returns, just a little cleaner. You also calculate the covariance between each asset so that the assets move with each other. You calculate all your underlying and summary values, including the sharp ratio. By the way, we love the sharp ratio. The Chicago quantum net score, the Chicago quantum ratio. You could do matrix formulas, matrix formulations of the Chicago quantum net score just to test it out. Um, so you're running all your base data for the all asset portfolio. So if it's a 40 asset run, you would do it for a 40 asset portfolio. Then you derive a cubo for each portfolio, size two to the universe, which in our case is 40. That's what D wave. That's what we ran on D-Wave so far. We never even tried more than 40. You visualize the minimum CQNS values and the average CQNS values to figure out your shift. And then you do your shift. You code it in. Then you run your best classical probabilistic algorithm. In our case, that's a genetic algorithm. To see the one best portfolio and its value, it sets the target. Um, we're pretty good at our genetic algorithm finding the best answer or an answer that looks really good to us. We don't know if it's the best answer. It's the best answer when you're looking at a small problem size. But at 40 assets, we can't actually validate without running 1.1 trillion. So it's good enough. It's the best that we see. Then we execute D-Wave using an appropriate range of portfolio sizes. You may not run all 40. You use the D-Wave results to seed the genetic algorithm and then you compare the values to the classical methods. So once you do that, what happens? And so I'm just going to walk you through the charts because they're going to help you. This chart shows the classical efficient frontier is what's in the yellow. This is developed. Um, this actually was a very early, early stage. So it's a smaller sample size. So the yellow is what's um, classically generated. The blue are the D-Wave values. So if you come down here, and I'm going to zoom in for you so it's a little easier to see. Because I really want you to see it. So the Chicago quantum net score versus, which is in blue, versus the quantum answers, which are in black. So you see how the black answers are concentrated below the efficient frontier. 
I mean, of course, they're behind the efficient frontier because they're in that space. You see one right up here. looks like it's right on the efficient frontier. And then you see a value out here, which is a bit of an anomaly, but it's a very high return, high risk portfolio. And so you got some nice options there. It's a nice spread. When we compare it against the sharp ratio, same kind of look and feel. So you see that the the D wave can give you answers. The Chicago quantum net score can give you answers against the sharp ratio that look great. This is how we get confidence that the sh that we've reformulated the sharp ratio in a way that it can run on a quantum computer and we can pick stocks. So that's terrific. Now there's another chart. I just want to walk through some of these other ones. They're actually very important. Just in understanding our our results, they might seem a little uh, mathematical here, but let's do it. So this one is the values that you get. So less is more in this case. Lower is better. So your genetic algorithm, your bottom ones give you the best answer. Your D-Wave is the second best answer. 500 million runs. Actually, that number um, is higher. But in this case, 500 million runs gave you a, a pretty good response. Not quite as good as the D-Wave. By the way, the D-Wave ran 60,000 rolls of the dice versus 500 million. Now let's talk about timing. This is in log seconds, so we can fit it on a chart. The genetic algorithm took 3.2, 3.5, the D wave took 3.4. What's funny is if you feed a genetic algorithm with the D wave values, it runs faster, one third faster. Now you look and you see if I run only a million Monte Carlo, I'm at 4.9, 4.88. Brute force is 15.7. Brute force is like a really long time. And even 500 million took hours as opposed to seconds. Why does the D-Wave take so long? Because in this case, we ran 30 experiments that we had to add up the time from all 30 to put them together. If we, in the next paper, can get this all to run with one run, it's probably faster than a genetic algorithm. But at this point, it is not faster because we had to run 30 different experiments. Now let's talk about the question that I had when I started this experiment, which is, is the D-Wave actually doing better than just random? And so what we did is, remember, lower is better. The blue lines are the quantum answers. There's 1,811 of those. And the classical is 950 million. It's red. So if you look at the answers at the, at the smaller portfolio sizes, the red is always higher than the blue. That means your average classical answer is worse than your average quantum answer. So put another way, your average quantum answer, and there weren't that many, is always better than your average classical answer until you get to 26 assets, 29, 30, 31, 32, and 34. For some reason, at the larger problem sizes, um, we find that the D-Wave does not give you as good of an answer as just running Monte Carlo. Good news for us is the best portfolios were the smaller portfolios, but we are going to keep looking into this. And so what have you learned so far? You learned that we came up with answers that look like they should. They look like efficient frontier type answers. You learn that the D waves a little bit slower. You learn that the genetic algorithm gave better answers. And you learn that on average, the D wave is better than classical. This is not just random chance. It's actually doing something. And then I'm going to walk you through the rest of the thing. So the weighting of the stocks. So we could have each stock have its own weight. As an example, the S&P 500 is a market value weighted index. We could do that, but then you'd have um, a continuous search space. So right now, if all the assets have the same size, 40 assets is 2 to the 40. If we were to allow discrete weighting, it would be something on the order of 2 to the hundreds. 
right? It, in this case, it's 101 to the 40th. That's a really big number. So it's better to keep the problem at a trillion possibilities than it would be to go trillions of trillions. Selecting our economic values. So we picked the Wilshire 5000, the S&P 500, and the Russell 2000. We picked the 13-week Treasury bills. By the way, a lot of debate. Why didn't you put in the, uh, the NASDAQ composite? We might next time. The problem is, is that most of the stocks we picked were larger stocks, more established stocks, not in the NASDAQ. So you want to pick indices that mirror the stocks. In fact, I just have a, a request from an investment manager to run some Canadian stocks, so we might have to put in a Canadian index. Uh, same thing on treasuries. If you're investors or U.S. investors, you want to use U.S. treasuries. If you're investors, let's say we're Canadian, you might want to use a Canadian market index. Um, we also, we don't like negative market returns. We don't think it makes sense. Why would you hold a stock that goes down when the stock market goes up? Why would you want to lose money? The third thing is we remove stocks with enormously high betas, over 10, less than zero, because that just usually indicates something like uh, a change in ownership or a bankruptcy or reorganization or just a massive loss. It just these are like story stocks that the high frequency guys would take out. So and we're selecting one year data because we lost too much variability in five year historical market data. We lost two thirds of the variability, which think of it this way, dampens the energy landscape that D Wave would have. So and you'll also need to make and we'll need to make market adjustments during times of market turbulence. So let's talk a little bit about quantum advantage. Um, we thought that we were going to find it, even a couple weeks before, but we did not find it. What we found was that if we use the D-Wave 2041 qubit quantum annealer, which came out in 2017, by the way, it's a three-year-old computer, and there are newer computers that are now being released, we have to use a repeatable research and business process where we can actually pick a good portfolio out of 40 assets, a great portfolio out of 40 assets. So as practitioners, not academics, we think that if we were to go up to 60 or 80 assets, there's a potential for quantum advantage. You know, at lower assets, no way, right? No, lower asset levels, there's no way. And maybe even at 80, it's not because we could maybe find one portfolio that's just as good. But the challenge with portfolio optimization is you're looking for an energy landscape. You're looking for the types of stocks that you might recommend to a client and not just one black box solution. So if you do brute force, it's going to take hours to run. It's much slower. Um, genetic algorithm, what's interesting is I don't know how this is going to scale. For 16 assets, it's significantly less than a second. It showed up as zero, so it was less than half a second. For 40 assets, without the D-Wave as a seed, it's 31 seconds. So what does that mean? For 41 assets, it's twice as many answers to go through. So maybe it's 60 assets. What am I, half hour? I don't know. We're going to find out. And so we're going to keep going with this. And so next steps, what are we going to do next? We're going to evaluate reverse annealing. Um, we're going to revert, we're going to look at simulated annealing. We may even consider use of the D-Wave hybrid solver, depending on our, uh, our budget. And we're going to optimize larger and more diverse portfolios. And longer term, we're going to add different types of financial assets, including bonds, commodities, real estate, investment trusts, and currencies, such as Bitcoin. Uh, those have different math, though. And so those are going to take a fair bit of work to get down to the math and be able, be able to embed on a Cubo. And so, and then we have a significant number of references. We stand on the shoulders of giants with this work. And finally, I just want to thank the writers, maintainers, and community contributors for all the tools we used. We used Python, NumPy, Pandas, Matplotlib, you know, SkyPy, Skypy, D 
D-Wave Ocean, Julian R. You know, we want to thank D-Wave Systems, Google, Slack, Anaconda, and Jupiter for use of their tools in the research effort. We want to thank everyone. And um, just again, I want to wrap up by giving a shout out to the team. You would have seen this in uh, the first video. Just, uh, you know, myself, I'm Jeff Cohen. We have Clark Alexander, who's our math PhD, who does data analytics every day for clients. He works in this field. It is his, uh, his field. We have Alex, portfolio management, project and program management, experienced IT executive, um, has got a lot of depth and has been just amazingly uh, committed and driven for this. Um, myself, I'm a consultant, uh, classically trained in economics and finance, and have worked for some of the largest, uh, greatest consulting and technology firms, and uh, have built some really amazing consultancies. And so, again, I want to thank you very much for listening. Again, remember, we are Chicago Quantum. We are a service mark or a division of U.S. Advanced Computing Infrastructures Incorporated, and our job is to create quantum advantage for enterprise scale clients. We do management consulting, we don't sell software, and we're just trying to help clients solve problems. So, and our first problem is financial portfolio optimization. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening.